here's my presentation, uh, ecological sites, uh, classifying landscapes for management. Um, I'm with the NRCS. I'm a rangeland management specialist in MARFA with the Soil Survey Division. Here's uh, my outline. Uh, I'll go over a couple of definitions, and uh, I'll go over the process of actually developing ecological sites through the mapping of soils and e ecological sites, how to access uh, ecological site descriptions, and I'll go through all the components of an ecological site description. So the first definition is uh, what is an ecological site? It is a conceptual division of the landscape that is defined as a distinctive kind of land based on recurring soil, landform, geological, and climate characteristics that differs from other kinds of land in, a, in its ability to produce distinctive kinds and amounts of vegetation, and in its ability to respond similarly to management actions and natural disturbances. And this definition is from uh, the Interagency Ecological Site Handbook, which was signed in uh, January of this year. And this handbook provides direction to the BLM, Forest Service, and NRCS to cooperatively identify and describe rangeland ecological sites for use in inventory, monitoring, evaluation, and management of the nation's rangeland. So here's an uh, example. Uh, of uh, two very different ecological sites. This is on Wilderness Ridge, Guadalupe Mountains National Park. And uh, the title here is from the definition, it's ability to produce different kinds and amounts of veg vegetation. And what's important here is of reference plant communities, also known as potential plant communities. And uh, sometimes that is, can be difficult to uh, discern because you have to separate disturbances. But on this picture here, you have a, a, a north versus a south aspect. You have uh, the same atmospheric climate, but very different soil clim climate um, based on you know differences in the evapotranspiration. So on the north side, you have the uh, uh, Ponderosa dug fir forest. And on the south, you have a, a breaks ecological site, which is a mountain shrub community, which is a desert ceanothus, non-mahogany mostly. Um, so the uh, the south facing does not have the potential to produce, produce the forest on the north. So those are two different eco sites, and they're not uh, the result of management actions or disturbances. Um, the second example is a more subtle difference between ecological sites. Uh, I could, you know, ask how many do you see here, and if you guessed three, uh, you are correct. You can see, the, in the foreground, you have a, a gravelly uh, alluvium landform, and uh, so, uh, soils are pretty gravelly. You have a short grass plant community, uh, some forbs. It's, been some grazing here, uh, mostly black Brahma site. Uh, in, in the middle, you have a, a drainage way, different land, produces different kinds and amounts of vegetation, uh, mostly tobosa and blue Brahma. And on the, in the background, you have uh, soils very shallow to uh, basalt, so it's a basalt hill ecological site. Uh, the second definition is uh, an ecological site description. It's actually the written document that describes the abiotic and biotic features of an ecological site. Uh, ESDs are used to interpret resource concerns and opportunities, prioritize and select management actions, and monitor and evaluate management outcomes. So, you know, how do we start developing ecological sites? Well, 
starts with uh, field work, um, vegetation specialists and uh, soil scientists and uh, work together. Um, so here we have a soil scientist uh, on, on staff here in MARFA, uh, Lynn Loomis, who's describing the soil, the soil morphology. And in uh, soil survey offices that are set in uh, areas that are predominantly rangeland, you have rangeland specialists. Other areas uh, may have uh, foresters or ecologists, but uh, typically a uh, veg specialist. And the key is to go out there, uh, a multidisciplinary approach. Sometimes you can have a uh, geologist out there assisting. And uh, once there's a, uh, a soil pattern is extensive enough, uh, a named soil series is developed. And uh, uh, in this example here, we have a Chilicatal series. And uh, the name usually comes from a, a feature on the landscape or from the topo map. Uh, and uh, series descriptions are a parallel to the ecological site concept. Uh, they have a range of variability. Uh, it's an in-depth description. And, uh, uh, and ultimately, soil series become soil map unit components. Here's that Chilicatal uh, name from the previous slide. It's on a uh, used when it's used in a soil map unit name here in italics, Copperspeth Chilicatal complex 18 percent slopes. That is a um, uh, soil map unit name. Uh, it's a soil map unit component, and the uh, ecological sites uh, on our database are linked to individual uh, components. Here, the Chilicatal is linked to gravelly, as is the Copperspeth. And uh, basically, soil scientists uh, uh, delineate the landscape. They, they divide the landscape into segments by using the soil series and uh, ecological site name. Uh, in this case, uh, Copperspeth Chilicatal occurs on proximal alluvial fans. Uh, this 414 map unit, uh, loamy skeletal soils occurring on uh, proximal alluvial fans. Um, they're coming from these, they're derived from these uh, limestone hills and mountains, map unit 404. This is rock outcrop, 20 to 60 percent slopes. Those are shallow, loamy skeletal. Skeletal means that the subsurface of the soil by volume has 35 percent or more uh, rock fragments. So it's pretty, a pretty rocky soil and, and it can be droughty. And this occurs on limestone hills and mountains. Uh, so it's linked to limestone hill, mountain, desert, grassland, ecological site. Uh, you'll see desert grassland here in uh, our area in West Texas we use, that's the vegetative zone that, or the climate zone. Uh, that this, all these suite of ecological sites are occurring. It's in the 12 to 14 inch precipitation zone. Um, and uh, map unit 405 is our deep is our soils are occurring on distal alluvial fans. So basically the rocks have played out. You have a real loamy soil and uh, you have different ecological sites and eventually at the very bottom of the landscape 3A, you have uh, on the basin floor deep clayey soils. You got the Verhalen Dalby Association, zero to one percent slopes, uh, and that is where the clay flat desert grassland ecological site resides. And the uh, ecological sites are named based on environmental factors such as soil characteristics, landforms, slope, climate zone, etc. And here's a uh, illustration of the different ecological sites, the four different ecological sites of the previous slide. There's that limestone hill, mountain, desert, grassland up on the top left. Uh, the alluvial fan, the gravelly desert grassland, loamy desert grassland, uh, and the clay flat desert grassland. You can see that there's a uh, very distinct species composition 
and uh, different responses to disturbance. Uh, uh, actually, the, the gravelly, the clay flat, and the loamy were all taken from the previous landscape. So it's really the same management, but you can tell they're uh, really different plant communities. Now, within an ecological site, you can have uh, plant community dynamics. Uh, so in, the, in this instance, the, the, you've seen the picture on the right is the gravelly. Uh, that's a pretty, uh, pretty uh, an area that's been pretty, uh, grazed pretty hard. Um, as you can see, you could barely see any grasses. And it's pointing on the left side to the reference plant community. So every ecological site has a reference. It's, it's potential. Uh, in the absence of uh, ex you know ex excessive disturbances, it's basically natural disturbances of uh, of the area. The picture on the left is from a national park that's been uh, you know without grazing for over 40 years, uh, but it's the same climate zone, same soil map unit, same soil morphology, same ecological site, but uh, they're just different states. Uh, uh, can you Restore the picture on the right to the plant community on the left. You know, it's, sometimes it's a challenge, especially in the Chihuahuan Desert. Uh, you know, can you restore that black Brahma once it's been wiped out like that? Um, sometimes you cross a biological threshold that's irreversible. Um, so uh, these ecological sites can help you determine if you want to spend money, resources on the picture on the right. Uh, the dynamics on other sites are more complex than others. Um, so this is the clay flat picture that you recognize on the top left, the reference plant community. Um, now, there's a lot more dynamics on this one um, based on disturbances. Um, uh, you can, you know, th this area, you know, has, uh, can be cultivated, uh, irrigated cropland on the bottom left picture. Here, um, uh, other areas where uh, uh, livestock has uh, brought in some uh, mesquite or shrubs have been encroached, and uh, the grasses have gone patchy in the middle. Uh, some areas where the grasses have gone patchy, but the, uh, the shrubs haven't encroached uh, in, the, in the middle center picture uh, right here. And uh, then you can eventually wipe out the tabosa and uh, and have a site with you know an abundance of a bare ground, or you can have another area where there's a, actually a lot of active erosion going on, and it is highly unlikely that you can go from here or from this picture all the way back to here. Uh, ecological sites. I mean, this is all the same climate zone all the same uh, soil morphology. These are uh, vertisols, clay flat desert grassland. Uh, you can see some of the cracks from the shrink and swell uh, of the soil. So this is all, the ecological site description captures all these dynamics and explains, you know, what caused it, what, you know, can you realistically go back to another uh, community? Uh, so. And feel free to ask me any, any questions, you know, during this presentation. Um, there'll be some time afterwards as well. Um, so, okay, so that's basically an overview of basically ecological sites. I'm going to go through uh, basically how you can access them. And um, these are basically two websites. Um, and the top one is Web Soul Survey. And if you Type in web soil survey on you know, on Google, and you could you know get right to it. Um, and it's a top link, and that's uh, that's basically how all of our um, soils information is uh, disseminated to the public. Uh, soil survey used to publish hard copies of soil maps, but now it's all digital. So when you get to this front this page, uh, you're going to start with this green button here, 
But before that, there are some links here on how to use WebSoul Survey, very useful links here on the bottom right. There's some four basic steps that kind of walk you through the, the process of producing all sorts of soils information. So hit the green button. And uh, it's just recently been updated, updated to uh, 3.0. Okay. Refreshing here. So now uh, quick navigation on the far left is where you want to start. You can start with an address, a state and county, sole survey area, if you have coordinates, uh, township and range. Uh, there's some uh, public lands that have been mapped uh, with soils, some national park units. You can go to individual parks. Uh, of course, not all national parks and not all Forest Service lands have been, been mapped. Um, but I'm going to start, uh, and this is to get to your area of interest. Where, where do you want to produce a, a soils map, an ecological site map? Uh, so what I'm going to do is demonstrate with a bat and long. Oops, pasted the wrong. Okay. I'm going to navigate to that exact same 3D block diagram that I had on my PowerPoint. So I'm in Hudspeth County in far west Texas. Uh, this is an area of interest interactive map. It's actual uh, space, uh, aerial photography. I'm going to zoom out one click. Okay. What you want to do now is click on the area of interest. You can define it by a rectangle or uh, I'll use a polygon. So I'll click on the area of interest and, and I'm just going to click oh, an area. Your area of interest can now be uh, up to uh, 100,000 acres. So now here's uh, your uh, area of interest. Now I want to, uh, you can produce just a soil map and you can click on this tab on the top left here it says soil map and you could produce a nice uh, mini manuscript of your area of interest which is really nice. Uh, you could also click on soil data explorer. And here you can get a lot of uh, information on uh, how suitable is your are the soils in your area of interest for all these interpretations, um, construction materials, building site development. But um, what what I want to show you here is this ecological site assessment. And actually, there's the uh, it already started to produce a soil map with the the, the legend. I'm going to click the ecological site assessment tab now. And now it's producing our ecological site map. And this is our, our broad uh, alluvial, our basin floor, that clay, clay flat site. Um, our limestone hill, our gravelly site, our loamy, and here is our legend. Here's that Verhalen Dalby Association, our map unit name, and it's broken up by components. 
And it's important to note that um, some, uh, this is order three mapping, and on some map unit names, uh, you can have multiple uh, components. And in some cases, they can be different ecological sites. Verhalen and Dalby, in this case, go to both clay flat desert grassland. But in sometimes the Dalby, or you can have another soil that goes to a different ecosite. But when you produce a map, your dominant soil, which is Verhalen, 65%, will always show up. The dominant ecological site always shows up. So you can always be aware that you can have other ecological sites kind of at a lesser percent in here. Um, and there you also have um, unnamed minor soils. So there's always there's inclusions in there. It's not 100% clay flat. And, and that's the case for every uh, map unit. In this Bissett rock outcrop, uh, Bissett is 65%. You get an ecological site. Rock outcrop, there's no vegetation growing on it. It does not get a rating for an ecological site. Now, uh, here's also uh, some information here on uh, on the four ecological sites. Here on Web Soil Survey, you can get information on the different plant communities. Uh, if, uh, get a state transition diagram, the ecological dynamics description. However, this is kind of a, a subset of the information of a full ecological site description. It's in the process of getting updated. Um, you could click here and view ecological site information. And you get pictures of the different plant communities that uh, uh, occur on the uh, ecological site and your model and a dynamics part. However, I kind of tell folks uh, that you can um, either uh, print this out or, or remember these uh, site names and site IDs so that you can minimize and go to this other website. I can go back to my PowerPoint. If you come back to this website, it's an uh, NRCS website, and it will list all the approved ESD reports that have been completed. Uh, the way we stratify basically the country is through a major land resource area, MLRAs. It's a, a spatial framework used by NRCS. Uh, and its boundaries reflect kind of homogeneous areas of land use, topography, elevation, climate. And you can use this MLRA Explorer link to tell you what MLRA you're at. But I'm going to look up the ecological site descriptions that were on my area of interest. For example, so I'll come to uh, Texas and hit submit. Uh, so these are all the completed, approved ecological site descriptions for uh, the state of Texas. And they are organized by MLRA. And here's your identification number and a common name. And we're now starting to put the, a biotic name, which is basically uh, uh, the dominant indicating plant community of the reference plant. And uh, uh, so if you go straight to this website, you know, uh, you may not know which site you need or is in your area of interest. That's why we rep recommend going to the Web Soul Survey. You can go to your area and uh, uh, get a list of sites, and you can uh, click on it here, find it on this website, which here on the very top, it just so happens to be in the very top, it's a clay flat desert grassland, which I've been showcasing. So we'll click on that one. 
And here are all the components on the left-hand side uh, of an ecological site description. You start off with a general page, the name, the biotic community, the site ID, the MLRA. Uh, here in West Texas, we're in the MLRA 42. And there's an ecocyte concept narrative. And these are the sole map units of where the site is mapped in West Texas. The, the next section is uh, physiographic features. You have a short little narrative. Uh, you'll sometimes have a version of a block diagram, an image. And you'll, it'll be broken up uh, uh, a little table with the landform, elevation, flow, flooding, ponding, and runoff. Uh, if applicable, the flooding and ponding. And there's a runoff class and uh, aspect information if there's an influence. Uh, the second section is a climatic features. There's a narrative about the, the climate. It's, 12, it's in the 12 to 14 inch precip zone and it mostly comes 75% in the summer. Um, there's a little table, a breakdown, monthly precip and temp. And here are the climate stations used to do, uh, summarize that information. Water features, and this is filled out if, mainly if uh, you're dealing with wetlands. Uh, soil features, uh, there's a short narrative uh, you know, about the soil. It, it's not meant to be very technical like the official series description that the soil scientists develop. Um, you could have a soil profile image here. I put, uh, in lieu of that, I put a close-up picture of the cracks that are very distinctive on this side because of the shrink swale potential. Uh, it tells you about the parent, mater parent materials, the surface texture, uh, surface fragments, subsurface fragments, and some uh, history of the soil, um, available water capacity, and it, since it's a clay, it can really hold a lot of water. Uh, plant communities. Starts off with the uh, ecological dynamics of the site. Um, what is the reference plant community? Uh, some of the inherent features of the site, uh, some of the natural disturbances, such as uh, if there was a, a fire frequency, uh, uh, any uh, information about ranching activity by settlers, you know, in this region started in the late 1800s, talk about droughts, um, and it basically summarizes your state's transition diagram I'm going to try to zoom in here. So here's, it might be a little blurry, but um, here's a state and transition diagram. And it basically describes all, this, all the, the dynamics. It's a model of the dynamics. And it, it, uh, it suggests general pathways that the vegetation might follow with disturbances. You know, uh, it may not. Uh, we do our best with capturing all the communities and states. Uh, we do get um, as much input from other folks from other agencies, from uh, uh, the state biologists, from anyone who has can contribute to this. Sometimes we have workshops. Um, uh, anybody who can provide input as to the this uh, to add to these dynamics. Um, so um, here, each large box is a, is a state, which uh, is a basically uh, something that uh, is stable. Uh, and within each state, you can have uh, multiple plant communities. So within the grassland state, it's basically characterized by less than 10% uh, shrubs. And it's, it's a very stable. Uh, plant community is grassland. 
through some grazing, uh, you can, and through absence of fire, you can go back and forth from a Tobosa vine mesquite, a little more diverse to a more higher canopy cover of Tobosa. And uh, between these two plant communities, these can are pretty dynamic, kind of go back and forth. But you really have to input a lot of energy, really disturb a state so that it can transition to different states. So uh, out here, with some grazing and the introduction of, let's say, a mesquite seed through time, you can uh, uh, create a, a shrubland. And where you have a can canopy cover, in this case, we identified it anything more than 10%. Uh, and it can range to, you know, the, up to about, you know, 75% shrub cover. And uh, so with continued uh, disturbance uh, management actions that remove herbaceous cover, you can sw switch to a shrub and bare ground. Or uh, uh, in this case, up here, number four, mesquite hasn't been introduced, but you lost the herbaceous cover, and you have a bare ground and just annuals. And bare ground is anywhere from 30 to 90 percent. To get, and uh, the T on these uh, legends here represent transitions. R represents uh, restoration pathways. Uh, if you can read this legend, they're further described in the narratives. Uh, you could convert this land to irrigated cropland or pasture land. And eventually, you can get to an eroded state where uh, basically you have one-way arrows. And we're stating once you get to this point, you've crossed a, a threshold that may be irreversible. You probably won't be able to get back into these other states, um, um, you know, realistically, you, you know, you may have to spend a lot of money, something very small scale. You may have uh, lost so much topsoil that, you know, you can't get back to this reference. But the uh, target may not always be your reference plant community. Uh, plant community 2.1 that has a you know, pretty good shrub cover can be desirable if the objective of the landowner or land manager is to have some shrubs or some patchy tobosa where you can increase the forbs and that will increase the uh, seed production for uh, certain birds. Uh, so this 2.1 will have more wildflower forb production than 1.1. So, um, so those are some things to keep in mind. Uh, there's a there's a narrative on each on each state. There's a quick narrative. There's a picture of the communities, and there's if there's multiple pictures, we'll put multiple photos. And uh, then there's uh, narratives. There's plant community lists. Uh, with uh, production, and if we have foliar cover, we can put it per species. If you click here, it'll take you to the USDA plant uh, website. Um, all the plant lists that can occur, production, uh, structure and cover, uh, basal cover, um, this is uh, canopy cover, biological crust if identified, uh, bare ground, um, this is by height cover by canopy cover by height. There's a growth curve. And the same information repeats itself for each community phase. And here's more information. Here's some information on the transition and the pathways. And uh, uh, let's see, so and I won't I won't go through every single community, but you know here's the one with the shrubs some other examples. So I'll go back up. Uh, I'll click on another link. I'll go not um, ecological site interpretations. There's the animal community. There's information about livestock interpretations, if it's suitable for livestock. 
um, toxic plant information, wildlife interpretations, uh, what um, species are uh, known to occur on the site, and uh, there's a plant preferences by animal kind. Uh, so blue grama by cattle, what part of the month is it preferred or desirable? And the same goes for different uh, uh, animals. There's a section on uh, hydrology. There's a summary, a narrative on hydrology, recreational uses, wood products, other products. We'll go back up. And that's basically, and you can get a, a complete, click on complete report and get the entire report. You can get it in printable format, uh, create a PDF. So there's also, uh, I skipped on the range health, but there's also, uh, I'm going to scroll to the very bottom real fast. Sorry. Um, there's a reference sheet for those familiar with uh, um, in indicators of rangeland health. Uh, this is a reference sheet for the reference plant community so that you can compare or uh, identify the, the health of your um, of your site, of your location, to the reference plant community um, using the indicators of rangeland health. So that's, those are all the components of an ESD. Um, I'll go back to my, and yeah, that's the last of, my last slide right there. Um, so now we're right at almost one o'clock, but do we uh, have any questions? Michael, this is Amy. Um, first of all, I just want to thank you for presenting this uh, incredibly powerful tool to us. Um, and maybe you want to leave your last slide up there in case folks, yeah, want to um, write down your contact info. Um, I can see how this is just really a powerful tool and, and definitely relevant to our critical management question that we're looking at. Um, if we are at the top of the hour, but if, if Michael has time, um, I think he indicated he had a little bit more time. So does anyone have any questions for Michael? Okay. I had a question. I was curious, um, when you get to the point in, the, um, in this tool in the ecological state transition model, I would imagine there's quite a, when you're looking at the potential for the site and whether it's crossed a threshold, um, you know, beyond which it would be very difficult to restore um, a grassland, say, um, I would imagine that there's quite a lot that goes into making that determination. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. Uh, right. Uh, yeah, it, it is. Uh, we're, we're, we attempt to quantify when you cross the threshold, whether you're going from grassland to shrubland, uh, uh, you know, what canopy cover of shrubs. Uh, the percent bare ground, uh, you know, how much bare ground do you need where you've really, uh, really crossed that threshold? Uh, an important uh, uh, key is out here in the semi-arid Chihuahuan Desert, when you've lost the vast majority of the grass species, where you don't even have the basal clumps anymore, the, the, the entire blue grama plant, the entire tobosa, the entire black grama is gone from a, an entire area, uh, you know, that you can be in a stable state, you can be in that state for a very long time and and typically uh, reseeding, reintroducing grasses in, in this climate is, is very challenging um, and that, so that's one indicator, the loss of you know, the vast majority of your plants. Another is to compare if you've lost, uh, look at the soil. Uh, on those areas that are eroded or lots of bare ground, you can look at the, dig a hole, look at the soil profile. And you don't have to dig a very deep hole, just, 
you know, a few inches, look at the A horizon, you know, and if you can't compare it to an area that's undisturbed of the same soil, same landform, same site, and see if you still have that darker A horizon. And if it's gone, that that's another big indicator that you probably cross a big irreversible uh, abiotic threshold where you've lost some of that topsoil, and uh, you, it, you know, you know how do you how do you restore those areas? Um, and and uh, there's you know so that's uh, also so those are two key things that we you know we kind of look at and you and if you don't have a reference area to you know dig a, a hole you can look at the series description the technical information on the soil and say okay well the colors of the A horizon should be in this range and uh, and if you're getting them if you're surface is the B horizon, well, th then you've got a major issue. So. Thank you. Um, I'm curious, with the folks still on the line, are any of you um, currently using this tool? This is Paula. I'm not, but I'm planning to. I just bookmarked it on my favorite uh, web page. So um, this is awesome. I think it's awesome too. I can see how it has really a lot of application and it's um, I'm really impressed with how it's so much information and, and thought um, has gone into building this tool. Um, it's almost overwhelming how much is in information is there, but I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to digging into it. It's, it's very cool. All right. And, and remember it's a, it's a work in progress. Uh, there, you know, not all states have ecological sites yet. Uh, they're mostly concentrated in the west, uh, but they are uh, making progress towards the east. And uh, um, you know, some states are further advanced than others. But I know uh, you know Arizona has quite a few developed, and uh, Utah and Colorado, and so, so yeah. This is uh, Ray Lister. Uh, we're We've been doing a lot of uh, grassland restoration treatments in southwestern New Mexico in the Las Cruces district, and we use the ecological site descriptions and the state and transition models um, more frequently now that, that they're being, uh, you know, freshly developed in some cases. But right. also, what we also do is uh, we do ecological state mapping in any area that we propose to be treated to flesh out just what state it's in. And the Hornada Experimental Range um, has a has a web page uh, that explains eco-state mapping. But uh, with that tool, we can actually go to a, a site and do the eco-state mapping and, and determine whether it's uh, gone past that threshold, whether it's a shrub dominated or whether it's shrub invaded, and make that call whether or not it's got response potential. So we, using those tools all combined, we've been a lot more successful in the results that we get. Yeah, that's that's great. And uh, yeah, I should have put up the link from the of the Hornada because there's a lot of resources there as well. They're they're doing some excellent work um, on you know the research behind the ecological sites. The Hornada Experiment Station in Las Cruces. Is there an individual, um, Michael or Ray, that you could recommend? Maybe we could find someone to give us a presentation, a webinar on, on their tool as well. That would be uh, Dr. Brandon Besselmeyer. Would, would be, uh, the, he, he's the individual that we're, we work with on the uh, state mapping. Exactly. That's a person I, I was going to recommend as well. Great. We, we will contact him and, and see if maybe he wants to join our group <laughs> or at least give us a presentation. That sounds great. It's really exciting to see these, these tools coming online and accessible to more people. All right, folks, anyone else have any questions before we wrap up? It's, it's, All right. Uh, Susan, just a question of clarification that 
Dr. Brandon Wesselmeyer, and he is, where is he affiliated again? It's uh, Besselmeyer. He's uh, with the USDA Hornada Experimental Range. Thank you. Thanks, Susan. Thanks for capturing that in the notes for today. Sure. All right, folks.